Hello, I'm Simon from Kent Libraries and this is On The Books, the library show born out of lockdown that talks about all things written word. Thoughts, ideas, inspirations and much, much more. So, sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation. Welcome once again to my little slice of digital Canterbury. Uh, today I have with me Mark Stay. He is an author, a screenwriter, a playwright, uh, has worked in publishing, and of course is, is the uh, one half of the act that deals with the bestseller experiment podcast and the whole bestseller experiment. So therefore, it's really nice to have you here, Mark, and I hope we have a good conversation about everything written word, really. Let's put the world to right, Simon. Let's start right here and now. Right here, right now. Let's just put it all to right. Yeah. So on that score, let's deal with Donald. No, no, I think we should probably... No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> You've worked in all sides of uh, the, the written word, really. So you write yourself, you've worked in digital, you've worked in publishing, you've done many, many different things. So I'd say you were pretty much an expert on the system, Yes. I've been around for a bit. If that qualifies me as an expert, it all started completely by accident. I, um, I love, I've always loved reading. I've always written stories. I come from a working class family. My parents were school caretakers. The idea of, you know, writing and publishing a book, I might as well have wanted to, you know, join NASA and go to Mars. Uh, but I got a Christmas job at Waterstones back in 1990 something. Um, I only meant to stay for Christmas. And here I am about 30 odd years later. So uh, it's, um, it's been a ride. I loved it. I had a great time at Wallstones. I, you know, you got, you, you used to have sales reps. We still do now and then get sales reps coming into the store. You get to know them. You get to know the whole, how publishing works. And um, I, I kind of, I've always felt like I'd snuck in through the back door. Uh, Cause I didn't even go to university. I don't know, have a degree or anything. I just read and wrote a lot, you know, and um, it was great. Worked my way up. Uh, Joined a publisher called Headline, became a sales rep for them, then jumped ship to a publisher called Orion. And I was there for 15 years, had a great time there. And that was when the whole ebook revolution happened. And I, I was asked to look after Amazon because you know those, those digital things, Mark. You know, that was, that was kind of my brief. Um, and uh, yeah, I dealt with Amazon until my uh, time was up there a couple of years ago. And ever since then, I've been a full-time writer. Um, but while I was working, I was writing books. I was writing plays. My wife and I started a theatre company, uh, which is one of the best ways. If you're writing, you want to know what an audience likes. It's great. Because we, we acted anyway. I, I wanted to be an actor and somehow ended up as a writer. But my wife <laughs> went to drama school and we have lots of actory friends. So we would put shows on. And I, I wanted to do a Johnny Spate play and he passed away and I couldn't get the rights to the play. So I had a venue booked, but no play. So I wrote a play about all the terrible camping holidays my family had taken me on as a child. And it was more therapy than play. But, um, <laughs> My dad actually did threaten to sue me and um, it went down really well. People really liked it. And a friend of mine who by then he was work, he was like a cable basher. He now makes documentaries. We're doing this Jeremy Mason, the guy I'm doing this oh. YouTube thing with. Well, yeah. He took me to, he took me to one side and he, and he said, look, there's too many actors, but not enough writers. You can write, keep writing. And that was 21 years ago. So I've always written, but I've been taking it really seriously since then did a few more plays, but I discovered my plays were more like screenplays. And so I turned one of them into a screenplay, which got optioned by a producer. And I met a director called John Wright. We made a film called Robot Overlords a few years ago. We've yeah. just finished, we just wrapped on a film this summer called The Little People. And, and yeah, all sorts of other stuff has happened along the way. So that, there it is in a, in a, in a quick nutshell. capsule. <laughs> yeah, quite, yeah, quite yeah. an impressive nutshell, but in a nutshell. <laughs> Well, well, it was the thing. The thing is, there's no one of the things I've discovered doing this podcast is there's no one route to publication. So if you're thinking, oh, I have to go on a course, or I have to go to university, or I have to know someone in the industry, that does help. Um, you know, how am I ever going to, you know, get a book published? And one of the things we do in the podcast is try and inspire people from all backgrounds to tell their story, get their voice out there. Yes, it's one of the, the key and most important parts of the bestseller project. It's one of the things I found quite most fascinating about it. Um, and I will come on to talking about the bestseller project. Yes. Um, cool, cool. Because I think we could talk about that for quite some time. Um, I do like to start with a proper question that um, it's bit, uh, considered to be a bit cruel by some. Um, uh, but I like it. And it's always fascinating to get the answer. So my first real proper question is, what book changed your life? 
that is a good one. Um, it was probably probably the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Ah, uh, good you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I was reading the Stainless Steel Rat books by Harry Harrison, which I would read and reread and reread and reread, and it was so much fun. Read lots of science fiction but stumbled across Hitchhikers because it had been on the TV and some friends at school were reading it. And uh, it's just, it's just a, that first book in particular, is just a work of genius. Uh, that led me to things like Terry Pratchett and just this idea that you can tell really thoughtful stories, but do them with a laugh. That, that really did make a, a big difference. And that for me, that set the tone, I think, for all my writing ever since, you know, it's, I can't write anything without a little bit of a sense of humor, without a little bit of strangeness or magic or you know, some otherness about it. <laughs> so um, that, that really has set the tone. Yeah, definitely. I completely get that. Um, oddly enough, Douglas Adams is on my bookshelf. Um, so is most of practice. That's where he's been. <laughs> That's where he's been. I, I stored him. I stole him once around and I hid him on my bookshelf. I'm sorry. Um, that's just not. There. <laughs> um, I mean, I get what you mean about Hitchhikers, though. Uh, it's just mind blowing in, in its observation of human nature um, with whilst you're laughing at yourself. And Pratchett's very much the same way. I thought, yeah, yeah. Um, Pratchett, I, actually, I found Pratchett um, quite interesting. As I think there was a change in tone, I think, from probably Nightwatch onwards when he really knew that he didn't have much time left. Yeah. And then yeah, no he really had something to say. And I think they are stunning. For, I mean, they were brilliant before that, but I think post Nightwatch, I think that there isn't one book where I didn't go away from going, oh my God, that man is just a visionary. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I, I did a little video on my YouTube channel the other day and sort of tribute to Terry because I think more than any other, you talk about a book that changed my life, but I think Terry, more than anyone else, just because of the volume of work and how prolific he was and the way his stories evolved. And you're absolutely right. Those first few are essentially parodies you know they're affectionate parodies you can see where they tie in you know Cohen the Barbarian stuff like that you've got the witches and 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 but yeah as the books evolve they get a lot more thought-provoking and a lot more introspective and they become less jokey mm. they're not you know they're still brilliantly written they're great wry sense of humor um but yeah Terry's work has um has, has, has had a huge impact on me. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet him a couple of times and, wow. um, and it's, uh, you know, he, he was extraordinary. And, uh, and the thing is, one of the reasons I did this video is, is my new book is someone has, a couple of people have come out and said, Oh, if you like Terry Pratchett, you'll like this, which as a Pratchett fan, yeah. If anyone else said, you'll like Terry Pratchett, if you like Terry, you'll like this, my fold my own. Oh, really? <laughs> Will I now? Will I? Yeah, so yeah. It ter it's a comparison that kind of terrifies me because you think, but there's no way I can live up to that. So my my con my conclusion in that video is: Am I trying to write like Terry? No, 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 no. Uh, but but has he influenced me and inspired me? Absolutely, no question. You have to see that as as anyone who does any form of writing, actually, because um, well, Terry must have influenced a whole generation. You can't he can't not have. You know, it's a bit like Tolkien when he wrote Lord of the Rings and spawned like a genre of fantasy as we now know it. You know, uh, it's like, although really all he really did was reinvent the saga, but let's not go there. Um, but, but you know, and then you say sort of like, you're writing like them. It's like, no, but you can't help be influenced by the people that, that you've encountered along the way, can you? So, yeah. Absolutely. I think one of, one of the most important things for any writer to do is to develop their own voice. And it's, uh, it can be a lot. Some people get it straight away. And that's Ooh. great. It took me ages to fight because I was I was cherry picking from all these different influences. So if you look at my plays, they're a weird combination of John Sullivan, who wrote Only Fools and Horses, yeah. and David Mamet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, you, and it wasn't quite me, you know, and I've got to the point. It's taken me a long time to get here where I am writing like me you know i i can just sit down and get it on the page and it's 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 my voice and it's um it isn't it, it because the temptation particularly if you read someone as witty as douglas or terry mm. uh robert rankin's another big influence yeah uh is is that you kind of think oh i can uh, if i tried to make a clever joke like douglas adams i would it you'd see through it you know yeah. you'd see through it but if i can be influenced and inspired by them and just put that my own kind of humor and spin on it, then you end up, you know, speaking in your own voice. And it's, it's, it's something that it took me a while, took me a long, long while, but I think I'm finally there. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, um, it's actually really fascinating here. Cause I think we, 
I could be wrong. I mean, my experience of growing up, and I've got some questions about um, education uh, and and our my age group, as it were. Um, I was I was at school in the eighties, and it was very much a case of a feeling that you you yeah your your voice didn't matter. You had to fit in. You know, you can't find your own. You should find your own, but you feel like you must meet or be like someone else to do well because they have done well, if that makes sense. Mm. It's, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. That's what we put on ourselves. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Be yourself. Be yourself. It's an important lesson to learn. Difficult one to master, but an important lesson to learn. I think that's the trick of life full stop, isn't it? At some point you actually learn. Yes. See, told you, told you we put the world to rights. Yeah. There we go. There we go. You're welcome, everyone. You're welcome. Life lessons. Next, world from, peace. From libraries and Mark's stay. <laughs> um, I suppose on that note, actually, that leads me quite nicely into mental health, actually, and, and how well we do things. Because in the modern era, um, we are obviously much more aware of mental health and mm. positives and negatives and influences and so forth and so on. So I would like to ask anyone who writes or publishes or deals with the written word, where does the written word have a place now in our mental health? Can it be a positive or a good thing for our mental health? Oh, of course it's a good thing. It's yeah. absolutely a good thing. I mean, for me, storytelling is how I make sense of the world. Mm. It's how I take all these disparate things that are flying around and, and, uh, and stories always, I think story has always done that since we told each other stories sitting around a campfire, you know, the, the stories we've told about gods and monsters and, and everything have all been, you know, a giant metaphor for life. And certainly, you know, you, I, I would jot down ideas, random ideas in, in my notebooks or whatever, and they eventually find their way into a story. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when the first lockdown happened, mm. I think like a lot of people, all the wind went out of my sails. I didn't write for a couple of weeks. Um, but then I, I started writing short stories. We have a thing on the bestseller experiment, a challenge to writers, which is just write 200 words a day. Right. That's all it takes. You'd, it's not about the volume. I mean, we're recording this in the middle of NaNoWriMo, which is like yeah. the month of November, where they want you to write 1,400 words a day, which is an onerous task. Yeah. But we've said to people, look, give yourself a year, write 200 words a day, your former habit and right. before you know it you will be writing a thousand words a day or whatever it is and i you know i took my own advice we did that and i wrote a little quartet of short stories right. um and then i got to work on the second novel in, in this which is a woodville series which i started and i i wrote a novel faster than i ever have before but it was if when i look back at those stories and the themes in those stories it's all about fear and you know listening to other people and uh you know um this too shall pass is a big idea in these as well the idea that you know you, you think things are bad now but they will you know it will end uh, yes. you know there, there is light at the end of the tunnel you just got to hang in there long enough which again you know writing is therapy you know so i, I think if you're a reader i mean i certainly find a lot of um one of the things I've started doing is, uh, you know, I wake up at usually about 4.30, just bing, brain is awake. Uh, and I used to, I used to pick up the phone and just go doom scrolling through Twitter, which is so, that's bad for your mental health. Tell me about it. So, so what I've started doing recently, I, I downloaded um, David Copperfield, you know, what? and um, I'm reading little bits of David Copperfield on my phone and it's great. It's, it's such a great way to start there because it's such a, you know, wonderful book, wonderful writing. Um, it just eases me into the day. So yeah, whether it's through reading or writing, I think right, uh, you know, story, the storytelling and the stories that we tell and the ideas that we can with our writing make a huge difference and you know i i think just getting away from a screen and onto paper mm. makes a difference as well ah that's interesting that's interesting because we yeah um because we live in a world of devices now that, that's purely simple everywhere we go we've got a screen i mean i think that's probably why i like black mirror as much as i do Wow. Mm. I love that show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to plug other people's shit, but you know, if you've never watched Black Mirror, people out there, watch Black Mirror. You'll be terrified, but it's awesome. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah for a terrifying treat. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, we we we. Um, I think uh, uh, Charlie did say that he called it Black Mirror because everyone carries a screen and on top is black. You know, we all. Yep. You know. Um, and what you were saying about writing on paper. So I mean, in I think I know where you're going to go with the answer for this, but because we live in a world. Devices. 
is there a place now for the written word, do you think, in its usual format? Or does it have to morph massively? Or is it still going to always be there? How, how do you think devices have affected the written word, I suppose, is my question. Uh, I think there's been a huge positive in that mm. people are re reading more than ever before. And reading on, you know, Kindle devices or Kobo devices or whatever device you got on your iPhone or whatever, um, there's, there's more eyes on, on and there's more opportunities for authors to get out there and get you know it's particularly with the self-publishing revolution you know you can publish a book today and people all over the world can read it and that's an amazing thing again if you're it's all right for me being sort of you know white middle-aged bloke right. uh but if you're from someone who doesn't see themselves in fiction or not nearly enough or you you know you have a particular point of view that maybe mainstream publishing isn't interested in at the moment you can get your story out there and out of you know seven billion people on the planet you're going to find likewise you know like-minded people so uh i think the opportunities there have been absolutely incredible and it has and we've seen this on the podcast people it's changed people's lives uh, it's given them opportunities that were never there before uh, the flip side is you've got that doom scrolling thing where, you know, you, if you're not careful, you can just mainstream, uh, poison all day. Uh, yeah. and it's, it's not great. You know, it's not great at all, but you know, it's like anything you've you know, need a little bit of self-control, you know, need a little bit of, uh, you need to mix things up. So I, um, when it comes to writing, you know, uh, I've a separate notepad for each project now. I'll make notes, uh, yeah. handwritten notes when I, when I start, then I'll hop onto Scrivener. And, you know, once it's a book, it's, you know, it's all, it's all there on screen. Um, so I, I mix it up. I, you know, I'm neither one thing nor the other. I think a healthy, a healthy mix. I, I still, I've been writing a diary for maybe 15 years now yeah. and that's all handwritten at the end of the day, you know, and it's just getting all the thoughts out of my head onto the page and I find you know, I get to sleep a lot quicker now where I'm not worrying about the woes of the world. They're all there on the page, you know? I mean, it is easy to worry about the woes of the world, isn't it really at the moment? You can quite easily, as you yeah. say, if you overload the, the social media or the news, it, you it can just feel absolutely oppressive. Um, mm. Yeah. We do need to be able to switch off somehow. Which is odd because I'm about Absolutely. to get up on a digital medium and ask people to pay attention to a screen. But there we go. Uh, <laughs> um, that's actually led me to two questions I, I think I'd like to ask you next. The first one being, and you've alluded to it, there, uh, growing up for me, and I know it has changed, but growing up for me, it was very much the idea that publishers were the gatekeepers to mm. the written word. Very much so. If you couldn't impress a publisher, you didn't stand a chance. Um, so... I think you've kind of answered it, but but it's that that's gone now. I suppose with self-publishing, it's it's well, it's still there. I mean, it's still there. It's uh, it used to be a very very clear path to publication with all sorts of hurdles to overcome. So you had an author, and then you had an agent, and then you had an agent who had to convince a publisher, and then the publisher that had to convince book chains, and book chains that you know had to market you, and then eventually at the end of that is the reader. Now these days you can have a very you can hop skip jump over all of those and have a direct relationship with your reader which for authors is a great thing one of the first things we say to authors is before you do anything start a newsletter get a very basic website up start a newsletter start that relationship with your readers from day one and they'll say but i've not written anything yet i haven't finished my book doesn't matter take them on the journey you know put regular blogs up saying uh, i'm stuck in act two i don't know what to do blah 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 and you'll find like-minded people will go oh i'm doing the same thing you know i'm stuck yeah. too and this is what we've found on the podcast, you know, is uh, the opportunities are there. So, but that said, you know, my next book is coming from Simon Schuster, major, major publisher, one of the big five. And there's a reason I wanted that, you know, I've self-published, I've hybrid, I've crowdfunded, um, you know, I've uh, gone and did my first book. So I think it's horses for courses and the choices are there. So, uh, you know, if you want to go the mainstream publisher route, then it's there. It's, it's, just as difficult as ever well, but uh if you want to self-publish then boom you can do it today right now uh, yeah i mean so it's options that's really what you're saying now we have options absolutely this is absolutely yeah yeah that's 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 interesting it's it's because i obviously i work at the at the end game as it were I, i'm surrounded by books that's that's what i do i i i deal with people coming in to pick books and, and read them but but in a reality, we have no clue of what actually is the process the person has had to go through to get the book where someone can pick it up and read it. Um, and most yeah. people, I don't think, have any idea what that involves or how that 
that that process happens. You just kind of go, oh, look, there's a book. I'll pick it up. You just don't think about the process, the work that's gone to get that thing to you in your hand. So it's fascinating to hear that side of things. It really is. Yeah, it's one of the things we wanted to do with the podcast was demystify the process and show just how hard it, it really, really is. Um, because I think there's there's an assumption. The, the only time you ever see book deals in the papers is where someone's signed you know, a million dollar deal yeah. or whatever. And it's really big, you know, the Richard Osman deal most recently, uh, yeah. for example. And people assume all book deals are like that. You know, oh, you're a millionaire. No, no. no. Adva- <laughs> advances are smaller than ever on average. You know, authors are generally quite skin. Um, and so, yeah, anything that can demystify that process is, is a good thing. And that's something we talk about. But it is incredibly hard work. People pour their heart and soul into these books. And, uh, you know, it's uh, when you get that one star review on Amazon or whatever, it can, it can be heartbreaking, but that's why we formed this community on the podcast. So we can all, you know, buoy each other up and share these experiences. I think it's about time we talked about the bestseller experiment then, since, since we've been alluding to it for a while. What was the genesis then? What, why, how did you, Mark and Mark and Mark, how did you come to go, let's do this? Well, I, 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 I got a, I, I wrote a film called Robot Overlords a few yeah. years ago, which came out. And while we were in post-production, the producer said, oh, we could do games, we could do a book. I said, I'll do the book. Uh, and I know who can do it because I worked at Orion at the time. And what the science fiction imprint at Orion has gone out. It's one of the best yeah, science no, fiction imprints I, going out. I was by Orion. I was like, oh. But anyway, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yes, I wrote the film tie-in to Robot Overlords, which was a brilliant experience. I really enjoyed it. I got published for the first time, which was terrific. Yeah. And a friend got in touch out of the blue. Someone I knew as a teenager. We went to different schools. We'd seen each other at gigs and parties and things. We weren't close friends or anything, but we knew each other. And uh, a guy called Mark DeVoe, who lives yeah. out on Vancouver Island now. He, you know, he grew up in the UK, moved to moved to Vancouver Island, and he's a real doer you know he makes things happen you know he's 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 now a life coach but he's done all kinds of entrepreneurial things in the past and he dropped me a line and said this is great you're living the dream you've made a film you've written a book uh and he said i've always wanted to write a book but i've never got beyond twenty thousand words i always either get stuck or i get tempted by the new thing the new idea and i start work on that and i get to twenty thousand words and, get, and it's a very familiar pattern and i recognize that and one thing led to another we both discovered we both love podcasts and so we said okay let's set ourselves a challenge let's challenge ourselves to do a weekly podcast where we talk to people in the industry authors editors all the insiders we ask them what makes a bestseller tell us about the craft of writing tell us about the process of publishing let's demystify it and while we're doing that we'll write a novel together we'll self-publish it and we'll try and get it up the kindle charts you know when we publish in 12 months time but the key thing we did the really important thing we did we said there's going to be people out there with a half written novel in a drawer where you know tucked away or like mark they've got twenty thousand words they've never got any further or they're starting from scratch and we said to all of our listeners beat us to it and that was the best thing we did because quite a few people did uh you know we've got i've got i've got a huge let me show you this there's you know there's one pile there yeah uh you know there's more books here all of these people oh there's another pile there all of these people were inspired by something they heard on the podcast so you know we're talking about Gollant, so mike shackle there he's got uh, yeah. he got a three book he got a three book deal with Gollant. he said he was on the verge of giving up writing for good. When he heard our interview with Jarbo Crombie, he was inspired to write this three book deal with Golantz part two coming soon. Uh, We've got uh, award winners here. Uh, Who else we've got? So uh, yeah, RNA award winners, Penelope Hughes, Lorna Cook was an uh, an Amazon bestseller. Uh, Ian W. Sainsbury, he won the Amazon, um, what's it award? Uh, I forgot what it's called now. Sorry, Ian. Uh, (laughs) You know, we've got award. People have done much better than we have. You know, they've just yeah. done incredibly well uh, because of this podcast. And it's the best thing that, you know, we ever did. And the great joy for me is a week doesn't go by where I haven't learned something new and extraordinary from, you know, one of our guests and all the feedback that we've got from our listeners. So it's um, it's been brilliant. We're 300 and... 50s well maybe i forget i lose count but we're hundreds of episodes in but you know if you start from day one and follow us through 
Uh, I'll just pick it up next week. Uh, next Monday, we've got Rowan Coleman coming right. on the podcast. A uh, week before, we had Sally Gardner. Yes. Um, you know, so we're getting these amazing authors. And every week, it's different. Every week, there is a different path to publication. So we re- really want to dismiss this idea that there's only one way of doing it, as you said, you know, the agent uh, publisher kind of path. Uh, people, you know, there, there have never been more opportunities to get your voice heard. It's it's a fantastic time. It really, do, yeah, I really, really appreciate and and applaud the message. Actually, that would that's sorry, I'm not, you're, we're behind you in the library wholeheartedly on that one. The more voices, the better, really. Yeah, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, what I'm fascinated by when I talk to people, especially, is it's creativity. I think creativity is is much undersold thing. In fact, actually, I, did you ever watch the Sir Ken Robinson TED Talk on creativity? The famous one. No. Have you not? No, 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 no. Uh, I mean, Sir Ken Robinson's um, passed now, unfortunately, but he did a TED talk, I think it was about seven years ago, you can look it up on YouTube, where he talked about creativity in schools. And he basically said, we have a system that crushes creativity. And if, if we yeah. don't have a change, we are going to hit a horrible situation. Um, mm. You know, um, so you are a creative person. Uh, very creative person. You've got your fingers in many pies when it comes to creation. So I was just wondering where you think creativity sits in in our lives. I mean, as a person who is creative, you're going to think it's very important. But do you think other people see it as as important as as you do, or as myself, I do personally? The thing that's come out of the lockdown is, you know, we've all been shut away. Book sales have gone through the roof. People are listening to more music. They're um, they're missing going to gigs. They're missing mm. dancing in groups. They're mi- my wife is a bell ringer, which is a creative what? thing. You know, yeah, yeah. she misses going bell ringing. Uh, we've you know we've all devouring Netflix. Now all of these things are creative enterprises. Yeah. Uh, you know, we I think we've realised that maybe we've taken them for granted in the past. Obviously, funding for creative enterprises uh could be better could be could there could be more recognition for it i mean the publishing and film industries which i primarily i primarily work in bring in a lot more you know than some other industries that perhaps have hit headlines you know (laughs) fishing um you know so so apologies to all fisher fisher people out there but you know it's some time has moved on and uh we're you know this this is a hugely important in industries that we work in and they have been taken for granted and as you, as we discussed earlier they help people get through the day yeah. uh, watching a bit of tv reading a book listening to some music going to a gig seeing people dancing whatever it is those creative ideas they inspire us they soothe us they're, they're a balm they are more important than ever and um you know to take them for granted is is a very bad thing uh so yeah i i I think it is important uh, and more important than ever and it's odd you know you look back at history difficult times do tend to you know inspire some great work i mean you look at say from 77 to 83 the the films and music that came out of that period where you know the economy was in the doldrums uh, you had punk come out of that yep. and disco and yeah. move movies and you know so it's um it helps it helps us put pen to paper it helps us you know hammer the keys and you know hit those power chords and what have you so i'm not, I'm not trying to go any much into education and policy as a government thing but you know it's all about the arithmetic math, you know it's all about english it's all about the c's and it's all about the stem subjects and i get why you need that in a society you do need that but if you look like i say if you look back through history the periods that we really remember like that stand out are well shakespeare and the elizabethan era which was a massively creative period the renaissance which was a massively creative period you know our epochs are done by, <laughs> by massive you know, the only one that isn't really is the industrial revolution and even still that led to a massive outpouring of creative endeavor i i think it, i think there's a there's a balance to be had i mean you look at the renaissance there's this, you look at someone like da vinci yeah. Uh, where you've got, you know, in the 16th century or whatever, you've got science and art going hand in hand. And I love that. I'm a big fan of the sciences. I, you know, I was rubbish at them at school, but I love science fiction. I love, you know, uh, the the 
progressive science, science, scientific thinking, which is always questioning, yeah. always probing for more. I think that's amazing. And it's led to incredible achievements, you know, not least, you know, vaccines, yeah. uh, and <laughs> good dentistry. I'm eternally grateful for these things. So, yeah, I think it's, um, it's, uh, and we've always, I don't know. I mean, you know, science can always be taught better at schools. Creativity can always be taught better at schools. I mean, you, you're talking about teachers working with fewer and fewer resources each year, doing their absolute best, you know, passionate people trying to work with what they've got um, and inspire kids to go on. But, you know, it's, um, but then I look at that, I, you know, my son finished school this summer, but, you know, we, um, we, we, you know, you go to schools and they've got, they've all got IMAX with editing studios in them, equipment I would have, killed for had i been at school you know and so it's uh, again there's opportunities there the thing that gets me is is when when my kids were much younger there was this emphasis when writing on correct writing and uh, what they call wow words you know those big elaborate words and i'm sitting there thinking yeah you send that to an editor it's the first thing the editor will cut from your manuscript you know really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely all those big words all those big words you know it's kind of yeah no keep it simple but um i i don't know things change things evolve uh this i'm not scared of change i'm not scared of things evolving i think we all have to uh take it in our stride really yeah things change yeah that's true nothing stays static absolutely nothing stays static uh, we like to think that it does and actually i mean i'm a huge fan of history i'm a massive fan of history i read a lot of history i'm really fascinated by history and the bit that i love most about history is that it's not set there's this assumption that it's the history it's the past it's the way it is and it gets revised every day every day something about it you thought was the way it was is changed because something's come up or you've learned something new or something's interacted differently and you're like yeah nothing is said <laughs> yeah and that's what we're seeing with things like black lives matter where people will sort of give you a nudge and say yeah you thought you knew what history was but let's turn back let's get a different perspective on this yeah. let's hear from other people and it may be upsetting to learn that in 1857 the British army would tie people to cannons and blast them with cannons you know yeah. well we did that yeah, we did you know that. I know I know we like to think of ourselves as a benevolent empire but crikey you know and that's not taught in schools you know we we caused two famines in Ireland yeah you know? uh, not taught that in schools so you know I think it's important to keep reading history to keep listening to new voices and uh, listen to it change but as importantly don't get bogged down in history. I think one of the problems we, we have in this country, because we had such a glorious past, you know, two yeah. world wars and a World Cup final and all that, <laughs> we tend to we tend to worry about those past glories and you know lean on them too much. And yes, we did wonderful things, but we can't keep looking back. We've got to look forward. We've got to look, you know, at, at what the future is and how it can be different and how we, you know, we might, you know, innovate and inspire others. But I do worry we get too bogged down in the past when it comes to, to stuff like that. Yeah, the, the, the focus on tradition and that rose-tinted past. Yeah, the empire is an interesting... I'm, I'm not anti the country I live in. I'm very proud to be... Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've done some amazing things in the world. The problem is we've also done some horrific things at the same time. Uh, yeah. And you can't have one without the other being yeah. out there. You've got to accept both. I mean, so... Uh, yeah, the other one that gets me was like, yes, well, we invented concentration camps, but let's leave that alone. <laughs> yeah, it's like, mm, yeah. yeah, but it doesn't detract from some of the absolute amazing things that this country has done. And I think that's where you get it's, you, it's either you're bashing and you've got a picture and it's all got to be good, or if you're doing the other way, where it's like, everything was fantastic, you aren't acknowledging that actually we're human beings and human beings are flawed. That's what we are nothing is perfect and this is this is where this is where creativity comes in because i think one of the great things about being a writer when you're writing stories with protagonists and antagonists heroes and villains you have to put yourself in the shoes of the villain you have to be the bad guy for a short while you have to see things from their perspective and if you paint them as a black cat villain you know you're doing them a disservice you you there has to be a bit of light and shade a bit of balance you know and through actors do this too this is why actors love playing villains because they get to be the bad guy for a while and try to understand the motivations and where they're coming from and what drives them and that you know that understanding to dismiss someone as oh they're evil 
you know, is, is the wrong thing to do. You know, the creativity allows us to understand the terrible things that people do and why they do them and how maybe we might prevent those things happening in the future. Uh, so yeah, the, another reason why creativity is, is essential. My favorite thing with villains, and I'm, I'm, I might be of the zeitgeist, my era zeitgeist, because definitely villains got complicated, is, is the recognition that a lot often the villain doesn't think of themselves as a villain that they're doing something for mm -hmm. a reason that there isn't very rarely is there straightforward evil. Uh, Lord of the Rings, my favorite book in the world, uh, well, one of them, and it's one I read so often. Sauron is really uncomplicated. He is just an evil force in the background, which means he's boring. No, no, not, not, to, not to dismiss my favorite book in the world. It's not the villain that makes that book amazing, but he's dull. He's absolutely dull. Um, Whereas, um, but think about Hannibal Lecter. Okay? Lecter Hannibal Lecter is yes, a great example perfect, of yes. this. Who, you know, who, um, I mean, that book, Science of the Lambs, it kind of almost ki almost killed off the horror genre overnight yeah. because you used to have, before that, I mean, you had greats like James Herbert and, and yeah. Stephen King, uh, who, again, wrote wonderful, malevolent characters. But, you know, before that, you might have had, um, you know, Dennis Wheatley, where it's the devil or whatever. There's some, there's some like Sauron, some big malevolent evil that's incomprehensible. Silence of the Lamb humanized evil, uh, Silence of the Lambs rather, and, and gave us, gave us in, in the form of Hannibal Lecter, who's charming and erudite, uh, but will bite the face off. <laughs> and, you know, it almost killed off the horror genre. Horror writers were suddenly writing thrillers now, you know, psych yeah. psychological thrillers. And that's that's that was a relatively new term, psychological thriller, where you get inside the mind of of murderers and evildoers and what have you, and it kicked off a whole new genre and changed you know that 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 kind of fiction forever. Um, so yeah, it's uh, we demanded more, we wanted to know more, and that I think was a great evolution in in, in publishing for for better or worse. You know, there are loads of copycat kind of serial killer novels that, that came after, such as such as the way the zeitgeist. But um, yeah, nothing was the same afterwards. Speaking of nothing that was the same afterwards, I'm going to ask you a question about something that I read um, for yourself. Um, so I missed the Star Destroyer coming onto the big screen. I was not quite old enough to actually see that the first time round. Uh, I only saw yeah. that the first time round on a small screen. And then much later in my life did I get the opportunity to sit in a cinema and watch that great big triangle roll overhead with that rumble and that music, which was, you know, by that point, my life had already been changed. So, but I want to ask you the question, why do you think that, that film, as a, as a film writer, uh, as a screenwriter, was so life-changing for so many people? Because it's totally changed pop culture. It totally changed pop culture. Yeah, again, for better and for worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, lots, of, lots of copycat stories that never really understood it. Uh, I mean, I was five. You know, <laughs> I was five years old. I'd never seen anything like Before that, I wanted to be a firefighter. A fire engine came to the school. I got to sit in the fire engine, put the hat on, make the noises. Yep, this is the life for me. Yeah. So I could, have, I could have been something useful in society, but instead I'm doing what I do now. <laughs> uh, and I, my, uh, there's an argument. Mum and dad, because I saw it twice, Mum yeah. took me one time, Dad took me another time. There's some argument over who took me first. I yeah. think it was Dad. Mum claims it was her. Um, but yeah, just sat there and this Star Destroyer come and keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. And immediately, um, uh, whatever that is, I want to be part of that. Yeah. What is that? And I read the Star Wars novelization, the junior novelization, the, the, the adult one, and then you'd see articles about it and you discover that people made films they didn't just appear magically on the screen there was this fellow called george lucas who wrote and, and made this film and he had all these other guys who who made models of spaceships and things so it's um but i i think the reason it resonates is because he wrote a fairy tale this kind of joseph campbell inspired mm -hmm. hero's journey fairy tale with wizards in space people always call star wars science fiction no. It's more it has, a, has a lot more in common with Lord of the Rings and uh, yeah. than anyone you know. You've, you've, you've got you know, Gandalf, Obi Wan Gandalf. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got magic swords, laser swords, and um, but he also puts westerns in there as well, and uh, hot rod spaceships. Yeah. It's this incredible, incredible combination that had never been tried before, really. I mean, Flash Gordon kind of did it, but it was a bit po-faced, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's. And it 
those visual effects and that, that kind of storytelling where it just said, we're doing this for kids. We're doing it with a straight face. Yeah. We're not winking at the audience. Uh, you know, you, there's a reason why people put Jedi as their religion. On, you know, <laughs> yeah. Whenever there's a census, because it, it, it is kind of almost like a way of life um, because it does explore some of those scenes in, in quite naive way. Uh, but it, it, and it came at a time, you know, 77, it came at a time, economy was in the doldrums, films were incredibly depressing, you know, other movies that year were like Taxi Driver. Of course. Uh, the film, famously, the film that came after um, Star Wars at the Man Chinese Theatre was William Freakin Sorcerer, a fantastic film, brilliant, brilliant film, but tense and intense and kind of depressing without a happy ending it they put it on for a week took it off put star wars back in again because it was the <laughs> film people needed at the time you know uh and i think there's a reason the mandalorian's doing so well because yeah. you know cute you know the, the the child the baby yoda is is just a, oh just yeah. adorable you know so so yeah it's it was that kind of fairy tale that that just appealed to the child in all of us. And um, I think that's why it's resonated and why it's never quite been done as well since. Uh, yeah. So much of our favorite films and our favorite books are wrapped up in when we saw them. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I remember going to see, I go to a friend's birthday party when I was, you know, 12 and we watched Blade Runner. Yeah. We were expecting Indiana Jones in space from, you know, the, the, the cover of the VHS thing. Oh, it wasn't that at all. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, and at the end, we were like, what the hell was that? And I read the Marvel comic book adaptation. And then I read Philip K. Dick's book, which is so different, but explores these amazing mm-hmm. ideas. And then when I was 18, the director's cut came out. I went to the cinema to see that. So that film has grown with me. Can I convince anyone in my family to watch it with me? No, they're like, they're watching, this is boring. My wife falls asleep. If I ever want Claire to go to sleep, I put on Blade Runner, 15 <laughs> minutes, you know, but because it's traveled with me, it resonates with me and has an importance with me. So I think, you know, if you see these things at an impressionable age, they have a huge influence on me. And people like me who saw it when we were five, we brainwash our kids with it. We, you know, we do, we have conversations where we go, what film do we show them? First? Don't show them the sequels first. Don't show them the, sequ- the prequels first either. <laughs> show them the original four, five, six. You show them in that order. You know, you have whole conversations in the way that, you know, perhaps religious folk might talk about you know, <laughs> what kind of um, Bible stories they, yeah. they will, will teach their children. Let's tell, let's tell them about the flood uh, yeah. before we talk about, don't you know, uh, the- Abraham is sacrificing yeah, his child. Start let's start with the nice with the story. story yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, so, yeah, it is kind of a way of life, uh, which is so odd. I mean, you, you know, you, you, as as a creative, you want to have, you want your stories to resonate with people and their lives. But, you know, that is a once in a lifetime kind of thing, once in a generation kind of thing. That it really is a lightning in a bottle. That really is that just it all comes together. At the yeah. Right yeah. And yeah, you won't yeah. get that again. Um, I, I get, I mean, with film, I know, I know we're not really meant to be talking about film, but I know film has this kick at the moment with the nostalgia kick. I was caught with it myself. Um, uh, uh, Jurassic Park is the, one of the films that I remember going to see. I was 15 and it's like one of those seminal films in my life because I, it was just, I was blown away in the cinema. And of course, when Jurassic Park, uh, The Lost World came out or the, 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 the new one, it is Lost World, I think it is. Um, Jurassic World. Jurassic World, that's it, sorry, Jurassic World. And the, 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 um, the tune, the, the the trailer for that came out and it was just the slowed down piano of the Jurassic Park theme and m- mercilessly picked by the, the um, media and advertising uh, moguls behind that. The, the, the creative team behind that knew exactly what they're doing and I knew exactly what they were doing and yet it still did it to me. I still was like, cool, yeah. just like that. Genius, yeah. clever and rather terrifying at the same time, really, but there we go. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I want to move on to um, the Crow Folk, actually, the, your latest uh, offering. Mm. Well, yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. The Crow Folk is the first in a series called The Witches of Woodville. Yeah. And Woodville is a fictional village in Kent yeah. uh, where strange things happen. Yeah. And the first story is about a young woman called Faye Bright who discovers a book left by her late mother, uh, she opens it up and it's full of uh, spells, incantations, sketches, uh, and a recipe for jam roly poly. <laughs> and uh, 
she thinks, hang on, was mum a witch? And so she starts dabbling in magic and strange things start to happen. And at the same time, this is set in June 1940. Yeah. There's a war going on. Yeah, Just been defeated at, at Dunkirk. Uh, Battle of Britain is about to kick off. And she's looking for some kind of purpose in life. And also at the same time, the village is besieged by the crow folk, which are scarecrows come to life, led by a charismatic scarecrow called Pumpkinhead, uh, who has some strange nefarious purpose. And the plan is that as the war goes on, Faye will discover more about her mother, about her powers, about magic. And while the war is going on, she will be fighting supernatural forces with the other witches in Woodville. So um, it's it's been a long. This has had a long, 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 long gestation. Um, yeah. But it was when my it was my script agent because I I'd, I'd written a kind of a TV pilot that was modern day, and it yeah. didn't. There was something about that didn't just click. It didn't quite work. And he said, um, he was talking about selling it to the Americans. He said, well, maybe, you know, uh, maybe think about putting it in the past. Americans love history. And uh, one of us came up with, oh, what about World War II? And that was it. That was the missing piece, putting it in the home front, World War II, magic. It's basically a bit like the last 10 minutes of bed knobs and Broomsticks. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so that'll give us some idea. And it's just been, it's been my happy place. It's been my happy place. You know, I, I love writing for film and TV, but it's always very collaborative. You're always in service to the project. You know, you, you're, you, you're doing this for the actors and the director. Uh, whereas the books, these, these are for me and the reader. This, you know, this, we talked about this close relationship and these are exactly the kind of books I love to read. And these, you know, I've had so much fun writing them. Uh, so I've just delivered the second one to my agent, which will, yeah. you know, so book one, the crow folk will be out in February, 2021. Yeah. The second one we're hoping for Halloween next yeah. year. And right. then a third one after that, and hopefully more and more and more and more. I mean, I would love to just keep writing these for, for as long as I, you know, as long as I'm inspired to write them. So you found your happy place, as you said then at the moment. That's definitely. You are. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's good. It's always nice to hear that. I mean, I was reading, as I was looking for, I was like, oh, that's the sort of thing I would like to read, actually. Why is it not here now? So I could have read it and then think about it. Yeah, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you get your inspiration, if you don't mind me asking? What, what inspires you? Um, it tends to be whatever puts a fire in my belly, you know, whatever. Uh, sometimes it comes from a place of anger. Sometimes it comes from a place of just trying to make sense of things. Uh, and... With the Witches of Woodville, this, you know, there's a war going on. We think we have things bad now, but then, you know, fire was raining from the sky. They had no idea how long the war would last. Uh, you know, how did people get through that? And, you know, we look back again with rose tinted spectacles at the war, but, you know, there were terrible things going on here too. And um, so uh, I wanted to create a place where I, I could explore ideas of uh, community. Because we moved, we moved from, we used to live in Surrey, about three years we moved out here to the middle of nowhere, rural location. Yeah. And there is a very strong feeling of community around here, getting to know your neighbours. When things go wrong, you help each other out. And I, I really, really like that, wanted to explore that. And, um, and just being inspired by, I go for long walks, you know, so you, I, I become a lot more aware of the changes of seasons and I've got, I look out, I'm very lucky. I look out this window. I, I can see birds and, you know, and things rummaging around in the garden and, um, you know, wanted to explore that as well. But I just wanted to, you know, a good fun coming of age story with a bit of magic, a little wry sense of humor and some little, a little dash of horror as well, because horror is very cathartic. The people I know who write horror and make horror stories are very well adjusted people. <laughs> they're, the ones, they're the ones who get all their, all their stuff on the page. They might look odd, some of them, you know, they might dress like a goth or whatever, but they are very well adjusted people. They've got it all figured out. It's, it's the, it's the people who write, uh, you know, um, people who write literary fiction. They're the weirdos. They're the weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> I was, well, the you mentioned there's scarecrows in it by their very nature. Scarecrows are unnerving. I've, I've, yeah. I've never, the, some of the creepiest things I've ever encountered in TV or the written word is the scarecrow, actually. And how they, I mean, well, you know, I, I, the one I pleasant, but in the main, they are just unnerving. Well, I grew up watching uh, John Pertwee's Wurzel Gummidge. I loved the Wurzel Gummidge that was on TV at 
at Christmas, the Mackenzie yeah. Crook one, which was terrific. I really, really enjoyed it, the tone of it. And it has a lot in, in common with um, Crow Folk, which is yeah. Woodville. But that uh, that John Pertwee was with Gummidge, where he would, you know, yeah. take off his head, replace it with another. You know, if you're six years old, you're watching that, it's like, oh, what? You know, it's, <laughs> it obviously had a deep psychological effect, which is probably what I'm trying to figure out with this book. Um, <laughs> this idea that there could be people made of straw and where do these people come from what what are they uh are they lost souls kind of thing so there's a little bit of that in there as well it's a yeah uh, it really fascinating actually uh, yeah when when can i get oh yeah all right no, i'm gonna get a copy you've got a book sold already it doesn't matter <laughs> you've got one <laughs> um <laughs> you said this You've always written. So when did you know you actually wanted to be a writer? Well, li libraries are very important to me. We used to go to the library every week. Uh, I bring home new books and you'd see there was um, you know, there were books on how to write and you'd read those and there were ones on how to write science fiction and what have you. And, uh, you know, so I would always um, jot things down and they were mostly terrible. I, I, I remember writing a science fiction story where I, I named characters after uh, friends in the class you know, and they were all fascinated by that. And, um, you know, you bump off people you didn't like. <laughs> um, uh, I used to, where it really kicked in was um, me and a few friends, we uh, used to meet after school and write sketches together. Yeah. And we thought we were going to be the next Monty Python. Uh, which <laughs> we, clearly, we clearly weren't. But I have never laughed so much in my life. And we would perform them at school. And... Um, People did occasionally laugh at them too, uh, usually in the right places. And um, we, I got a real buzz for that. So I enjoyed acting, uh, but I was always writing. And it was when my friend Jeremy said to me, you know, stick to the writing. That was that was when I took it very very seriously. But I've got I've got a notebook here. Here we go. This is this is my old notebook from when I wrote, you know, sketches and things when I was you know, fifteen years old or whatever. Um, so I've always been dabbling at it, but, uh, and it, it is, it's, um, it is how I make sense of the world, you know, and it's, uh, I think without it, I'd be completely lost. I'm compelled to do it. If people didn't pay me to put, I mean, it's only recently they've been paying me to do it. I'd still be doing it anyway. So I think that's usually the sign of a writer. I'm a bit like that with photography. I'm a massive, avid photographer. Um, I haven't spent thousands and thousands on my kit, but I've spent a fair amount. And if mm. I'm not, doing my job I've usually got my camera in hand at some point maybe someone may need to do something with yeah, it yeah. but yeah I, I, yeah. I think yeah. I, if, if people ask me I don't actually I usually say I'm a photographer rather than my job because that's what I think I do. well you want to you want to talk about uh, a creative uh, endeavor that's kind of been devalued and it is photography because yeah, it's yeah. such a skill we we can all do it now take photos with our phones or whatever but there's such a great skill to taking a good photo and understanding about lights and lenses and how that whole combination works and how you can you know create absolute magic with them um so yeah it's much misunderstood so it's uh yeah kudos to you it's um it's it's uh, something i barely have a grasp on but I we, we do know say, the basics. this is going to sound awful we do say um there is an argument in the community now whether or not phone photography needs a different title but that's snobbery i think in all honesty but we we've kind of got this sort of, like anyone can take a picture not anyone can take a photograph um, yeah 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 um and and you do get some people who get an absolutely amazing stuff on the phone you know um with planning and you know they can so it's not a case of your equipment you're using it's, it's the eye i think is 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 the, is the trick yeah. being able to see something and then knowing how you want that to translate but i suppose that must be the same with writing it's it's got to be a case of you've got to have an idea of what you want to do and then you know how to translate that onto a page and communicate it with someone else yeah and you you do that by reading as much as you can and read outside of your genre too and pick up you know steal frankly steal liberally <laughs> from geniuses and that's how you improve your writing you know it's uh reading dickens at the moment it's, it's like there's some of his stuff just feels so modern and contemporary yeah. um and it's you know, reading it thinking yeah i'm pinching that definitely the way he did that the way he did this you know this is just amazing it's too good not to uh but the th if you do it with your own voice if you filter it through yourself it comes through as something different anyway 
uh so yeah i mean like say you you've lined up 10 photographers because i live near reculver towers which yeah, you, you, know, you just have a look at in, instagram or whatever it's photographed every single day and uh you know if you look at my instagram i've got plenty of photos on there where i've been for walks and again you line up 10 photographers they'll take 10 different versions yeah. of it you know 10, 10 different takes it's that individual voice coming through um in in, in creativity of any kind yeah it's, it's it's amazing how creativity does bear some some really major similarities across any form of creativity and yet within the specifics that it's radically different it's it's that's a weird weird thing to do. so glad well, it's, uh, it's self-expression it's self-expression that's all it is it's it's you putting something in you know sticking a flag in the sand and saying this is how i see the world yes. and that could be through a song it could be through dance it could be through theater photography whatever you know strumming a few chords on a guitar it's um that's that's you saying and it's a scary thing to do yeah because you're putting your heart and soul into it and someone might go yeah pff, rubbish yeah. which you know we all have to get over and you're not going to please everyone but having the 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 bravery to step up and say this is me, this is how I see the world, is, is really, really hard. Uh, particularly, as we've said before, you know, if, you, you know, if you're coming with a different perspective you know, um, from, from what might be seen as the norm. So, uh, yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard, and it should be celebrated. It should be celebrated. I think we need to give much more kudos to, to creativity and go, you've done an amazing thing. I completely agree with you wholeheartedly so we are re rapidly running out of time unfortunately it seems that time has flown away from us which is a bit of a shame so i've got a few more like a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it yeah, up go for it. i work in a library and you did allude to it so i'm going to ask this um but it's always going to be a little self-serving for ourselves doing something like this but but what do libraries mean to you then oh well libraries again you know talk about happy place that was my happy place growing up uh we're going to um well, the, I mean, very early on, Mom, I, I lived in North London. We used to go to the library in Hornsey. And then when we moved house, I didn't return the Thomas the Tank Engine books. So I'm probably a wanted man in Hornsey. Uh, and then we moved to Leafy Leatherhead in Surrey and the fantastic library there. Wonderful, wonderful library there. And I used to come in immediately, turn left, go to the science fiction section. When I got a bit older, they had a, in the military history section, this is really ghoulish. This is early 80s. So, you know, wow. you have to remember the, the threat of nuclear devastation was all around us. You know, threads the day after, yeah. two tribes. That, that, I'm that generation. And yeah. they had a book on what to do in the event of a nuclear war. So I, I'd take that out, this morbid little kid reading this strange stuff. So, you know, again, trying to make sense of, of the world around me. And that was wonderful. And there was nothing... I just always felt comfortable there. Always, always felt comfortable there. I could discover anything about the world. And um, yeah, it was great. I mean, I go to libraries less now, but they are so more important than ever. More important just to give access to everyone and everyone books, but also, you know, access to the internet, access yeah. to knowledge of all kinds. So yeah, kudos to libraries. They're, they're so important. Well, I'm glad you said that. Um, that's going to be a key point of what I say. Yeah. Could have been really awkward, wouldn't it? Yeah. Could have been really Burn them all down. Them. <laughs> Close them all. <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> okay. I think my last question to you um, will have to be a bit more of a... Yeah, I think I know what I want to ask. If you could have written any book, if any of the books that are out there, if you could have written it, which book would it be? I don't know. Uh, the thing is you're taking claim to something that isn't you. I'd ah. love to say, I'd love to say Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, but then that is an expression of Douglas Adams and the way he saw the world. And that's, that's just not me. Um, I think I like I to learn some more, actually. It's not you, so don't do it. It's, don't. Not, it's not me. Maybe the Bible. I'd have written a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I always remember, because I'm not far behind you, so I will always remember the Red Dwarf episode where they they, they announced they found the first page. Found the page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely rewrite bits of the Bible. Yes, and that, that's that's caused all sort you know the misinterpretation of that over the years. Yeah, you want to see what all sorts want, of problems. Yeah, you want um, parentheses going? No, this is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you know, open the Bible. Be nice to each other. The end. Okay, because yeah. that's generally the message of it. Anything else gets a little bit complicated. Be nice to each other. Look out for each other. Be cool. The end. The yeah, end. That's yeah, it. that's that's the yeah yeah. <laughs> you'll get you'll get complaints about this. I'm sorry yeah, about this, yeah, Simon. You'll yeah, get complaints. No, <laughs>
apart from <laughs> controversial ideas, then we shouldn't be in the business. It's really right, exactly, important. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and on that note, I think we're going to have on that bombshell. Yeah, on that bombshell. <laughs> I think we're going to have to say thank you very much for your time. It's been an amazing thank you. conversation. Um, we've set the world to rights as we set out to do at the beginning. And um, I look forward to getting my hands on the crow folk. Remind us again, it's, did you say February 2021? 4th of February 2021. If you're one of these people who has access to NetGalley, yep. uh, if you're a blogger or whatever, uh, it's up there now, if you yeah. read now. I've just launched the website and a newsletter. And if you sign up to my newsletter, you get the first four chapters for free with 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 an exclusive introduction from the woodville village librarian araminta cranberry uh so that's exclusive you won't find that anywhere else so pop on to witchesofwoodville.com sign up to the newsletter and you can have a little sneaky peek right now right now people should now. do that now. I will yeah. Do. yeah right now <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time mark we hope you enjoyed the conversation with mark his book the end of magic is available in the library now and where you'd expect to find good books. We can't wait for the crow folk to arrive and we will shout about it when it does. You should also check out his podcast, The Bestseller Experiment. Fantastic. If you'd like further information on our digital services, then go to our website, kent.gov slash libs. If you'd like to follow us on Facebook, the page is linked below. If you fancy this as a podcast, that is also linked below. We hope you have a good day. We hope you're well. Goodbye. <laughs>